Good morning. It's Thursday, the 23rd of November, and this is Govind Rajathi Raj coming to you from Mumbai, India's presently smogged financial capital. Our top stories and themes for a packed news day. The Reserve Bank governor brings up systemic risk again, says non bank finance companies must reduce their dependence on banks. Oil prices are weak but could sustain supply cuts, push them up again. Sam Altman returns to OpenAI in a five day drama script out of Netflix. The Binance CEO pleads guilty, second biggest crypto star charged with fraud. Healthcare advertisements ranked highest in misrepresenting claims, study shows. And at 725,000, Indians are the third largest illegal immigrants in the United States. This is a core report with Govind Raj Atiraj. Indian markets are holding somewhat steady in recent days, but that could be another way of saying that they're back to their somewhat directional status quo. The BSC Sensex was up about 92 points to 66,023, and the NEC Nifty 50 got back the 19,800 level, ending up 28 points on Wednesday. While the secondary markets are on a bit of a pause, the primary markets are buzzing with activity and, of course, money. As market veterans have always told me, if there is a good IPO or initial public offer or the perception of one, then people will invest regardless of how strong or weak the secondary market is. And there seems to be going by responses, much better pedigreed IPOs this week. IPOs worth about 7,000 crores are lined up in this market this week, including that of engineering firm Tata Technologies, which opened for subscription on Wednesday. The 3,000 crore IPO from Tata Technologies was already oversubscribed and got in more than the four other IPOs this week. And this was also the Tata Group's first public float in nearly two decades. All the other IPOs launched this week, including one from Flare Writing Industries and the Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency, have been subscribed, rather oversubscribed, and will close on Friday. Meanwhile, the IPO rush also helped the rupee rise on Wednesday, in addition also to strength in the Chinese yuan, Reuters reported. The rupee was at 83.31 against the US dollar compared with 83.35 in the previous session, which was also its lowest closing level on record. Meanwhile, some $6 billion has come into the bond market from overseas investors, including in corporate debt as investors top up before India's entry into several global bond indices. On the equity side, however, foreign portfolio investors have turned net sellers again, but that's only for the last few days. The month of November itself has seen some $2 billion flow in, in debt, that is, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. NBFCs must de-link from banks. India Central Bank Governor Shakti Kanta Das warned banks to undertake stress tests and said that all forms of exuberance should be avoided days after imposing curbs on some lending. Now, the word exuberance obviously suggests an inference, if not conclusion, that the financial system is lending either too freely or there are clear signs of stress amongst borrowers. And more of that in a moment. More specifically, the Reserve Bank last week clamped down on unsecured lending by financial institutions and shadow banks to curb financial stability risks. Now, this move also triggered a sell-off in financial stocks in anticipation of an increase in borrowing costs for lenders and a dent on profitability. The recent macroprudential measures were aimed at ensuring sustainable credit growth, Das said on Wednesday, and the Reserve Bank excluded home and car loans from the restrictions since these sectors are contributing to economic growth. The risk weightages which the Reserve Bank had increased were largely aimed at personal loans, or rather small personal loans. The governor also fired a fresh salvo by flagging the increasing linkages between banks and non-bank finance companies, saying that banks must constantly evaluate their exposure to NBFCs and exposure of individual NBFCs to multiple banks. Given the increasing importance of NBFCs, the increasing interconnectivity between banks and non-banks merits close attention. NBFCs are large net borrowers of funds with exposure from banks being the highest, said the governor Shaktikanta Das, adding that such concentrated linkages may create contagion risks. All of this is clearly worrying, not for what is being said, but what could be unsaid. So to understand what the unsaid part could be, I reached out to Tamal Bandupadhyay, consulting editor to Business Standard, veteran banking journalist and author of several books related to banking. And I began by asking him why the Reserve Bank governor was shining the light on NBFCs. 
RBI is always concerned about NBFC in the sense not in a negative sense, but uh, it is well aware what's happening, which is why for quite some time now, NBFCs have now are being treated almost on a par with banks. You know, RBI first introduced the scale-based regulation for the upper end NBFCs, depending on the size. So their capital requirement, the way they assess the quality of assets, the NPAs I'm talking about, even the LC or the liquidity coverage ratio. The large NBFCs are on a par with banks, almost on a par. The scale-based regulation, that's what it is. So it's not happening overnight. And of course, the part of it and the larger picture is Reserve Bank of India talks about the interconnectivity within the financial sector. Because, you know, our banks typically pretty liberal to lend to the NBFCs. And you can call it lazy banking. But one of the reasons is many banks, they are not able to fulfill the priority sector norms. And when it comes to NBFCs and smaller loans and smaller housing loans, which can be classified as part of the priority sector, they are pretty liberal in giving loans. My understanding is of late, banks are more liberal than they should have been, both in terms of who to give loan as well as the risk pricing part. Which is why Reserve Bank of India also are talking about the asset liability mismatches and both banks and NBFCs more careful than what they are doing. So it's not overnight it has come. And why I am saying this, I probably knows more than what we know. If you recall, after the presentation of the last policy and at the press conference, RBI Deputy Governor Swaminathan said, yes, we are taking a close look. We are aware what is happening. But there is no plan to get something into that so-called this macro prudential regulation like raising the risk weight to make cap to make them have more capital and make money more expensive. But after five weeks, Reserve Bank of India actually did what the Deputy Governor said he would not do. So certainly that's why Govind, I am saying that things are happening which you and me we do not know. We have the till the June number, June quarter number. We don't have the September quarter the specific number. I think that numbers probably show something. Then exposure to NBFC is also going up and up. So when you said June quarter number, which number is this that you are referring to? I'm talking about all the personal loans, the loans of 10,000, 50,000, over leveraging of customers. These are all credit bureau data. If you go through them, you will find the rise and rise of that particular segment. 51% are coming from the relatively smaller places. And as of June, 51% of the borrowers have been exposed to at least four such loans. So that over leveraging also is being encouraged. Right. That's interesting. So you're saying that borrowers or most borrowers have four kinds of loans in personal loans of some part or the other. So it could be a house loan, a car loan, a personal loan, and maybe a gold loan. Up to 50,000 I'm talking about that bracket. Okay. So you're saying each person has four such small loans. Yes. 51% of the borrowers have exposure to at least four such loans. The June quarter number of one of the credit bureau data says that. Okay, so that's sort of linked to the NBFC part. But now if, if I were to take a slightly larger look, is this all connected? I mean, warning about exuberance, the NBFC linkages, and of course, the earlier risk weightages. You already said that we don't know what they know. But is there a sort of larger systemic risk building up that the Reserve Bank is fearing? Well, I think globally, all the central banks are careful about what's happening. The irrational exuberance, what I would say, post-COVID, it's a revenge lending, it's a revenge borrowing, both from the lender side as well as the borrower side. Now, I think Reserve Bank of India is not leaving anything to chance. So it, Reserve Bank of India governor every time talks about our macroeconomic stability is pretty good, absolutely fine and all. So, But at the same time, I think they don't want to be caught unaware anecdotally, and I can't vouch for it, neither I can name, I understand that there are some kind of things that are happening. If you remember, Yes Bank was giving loans to NBFCs, and whenever the loans were getting bad, they are transferring to certain NBFCs, and then again, bringing it back to raise its assets so that in percentage term, NPA can go up, good assets, etc. There was a sort of, again, interconnectivity or whatever you call it between a bank and a few NBFCs that Yes Bank was playing that, and it was caught. My understanding is this, again, I say that I cannot vouch for it, neither I would name. Probably a few other banks at this point of time have been doing this, you know, whenever the, an asset turned bad, parking it on an NBFC at the quarter end so that you have a better numbers and then some good assets to transfer to your. It's a sort of round tipping in a different way, could be. And the larger issue, governor, has, of course, this thing that uh, you are learning finally that NBFCs depend so much on the banking system because they get their money from banks. And very few have the capability of 
actually, if you sit up and the larger end, that's a different story. But many mid-level and the lower level NBFCs, they are completely bank dependent. They don't access market. So RBI is saying that that is also build the bond market, you no know, corporate bond market and all. Why not you depend? Because this is interconnectivity is actually lead to some systemic cracks. It's very somber, frightening note to end on. Let's hope nothing blows up in our faces uh, and Reserve Bank's alertness will save the day, hopefully. Thank you so much for joining me, Tamal. Thank you. Oil prices in a demand supply face-off. Oil prices are seesawing ahead of an OPEC Plus meeting set for this weekend. Global benchmark Brent fell as much as 3% is currently quoting around $80 a barrel. Oil has been weak largely on speculation that the OPEC or Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and their allies will extend output cuts or possibly deepen them. Bloomberg reported that Citigroup has put the odds of a further reduction at 1 in 5 while rival Goldman Sachs put the figure at about 1 in 3. An additional collective cut by OPEC Plus would raise prices by a few dollars, Goldman Sachs analysts told Bloomberg, while Morgan Stanley said it thinks a deepening of supply curves is unlikely. To understand or rather make sense of all of this, I reached out to veteran oil analyst Vandana Hari, founder of Vanda Insights, a Singapore-based provider of intelligence on global energy markets. And I began by asking her how she was seeing the oil price scenario, particularly as things had stabilized for now, following the tensions rising in the Middle East. So what's happening right now is demand and specifically demand concerns. So global oil demand concerns are very much in the driver's seat with regard to the oil complex. Now, the challenge usually with demand when we're looking in the context of the economic outlook and the economic scenario is that economic outlook and the mood with regard to how the global economy performs, let's say going into 2024, is at best only a rough proxy for oil demand. So even for very experienced oil market participants, they would be hard pressed to be able to connect the dots between what is the expectation, let's say, with regard to the US economy, will there be a soft landing or not? What's the expectation with regard to, let's say, the developed European economies and Chinese economy? And connect all the dots to what that should mean in terms of oil demand. So what happens in such a scenario typically is that oil prices move the swing quite a bit purely based on sentiment. And quite often this gets amplified by panic selling, knee-jerk reaction. You see a lot of herd behavior in the market. You know, some hedge funds start selling. Algorithmic trading comes in. So that's the kind of environment we are in right now. And of course, supply, I'm sure you would next talk about supply and OPEC plus as well. But there is a slight tug of war between demand and supply, but I would say by and large until OPEC plus makes its move in, over the coming weekend and the market gets to assess that in terms of what it means for demand in what it means for supply, I beg your pardon. Yeah, that's indeed my next question, because it's interesting that the Russia and Saudi have curtailed production, have said that they will extend those cuts and generally have continued to hint that, you know, they will control supply. But that's not really affecting prices despite the Middle East tensions and so on. And what seems to be affecting prices more is the prospect that demand will continue to come down. Yeah. So if you look at OPEC plus, that OPEC non-OPEC alliance of 22 member countries controls about 41 million barrels per day, give or take 41% of global production. So they are in a position of strength. They have also become stronger this year, their cohesion has been good. The discipline with cuts has been good uh, overall, not 100%, but generally good. And then the U.S. has stopped being a swing producer. So that has also given quite a lot of power, let's say, to OPEC Plus in terms of controlling supply and in, in turn directly controlling, trying to control prices. A slight problem with OPEC Plus, the way I would put it, is that it's a victim of its own success. So when OPEC plus cuts output and it sort of sets a market expectation. So now going into the meeting on coming Sunday or ministerial meeting, the market expectations, we saw some news reports, not quoting anybody, nobody went public with any statements in terms of like OPEC ministers trying to jawbone the prices. That didn't happen, but a lot of anonymous sources were quoted by media saying that OPEC might potentially even deepen, further deepen its cuts. So you see, this is, 
sort of an interplay, as it were, between OPEC signaling, between what the media portrays and sort of sets market expectations and how the market reacts in turn, responds to it. So in a way, I would say OPEC plus is almost a little bit in the corner. I feel at a minimum, they will extend the current cuts. They may be redistributed. That's another story. But they will try and not increase production from current levels. There is a chance, I would say at this point, probably 50-50, that they deepen the cuts. But see, deepening, further deepening cuts is always a little bit tricky because Saudi Arabia has already has overextended itself in terms of cutting far deeper. So then the question is, you know, what are all the other members willing to share some of that cut or does Saudi Arabia have to continue carrying on that burden? So that remains to be seen. Right. And you said U.S. is not a swing producer anymore. So what's changed in why is that? Yeah, so what has changed is in terms of the profile of the shale sector in the U.S., which is the tight oil from shale accounts for nearly 73% of U.S. total oil production. It accounts for 100% of the growth in U.S. oil production. Now, by nature, the shale sector could have been a swing producer because they can bring on stream new production very quickly, you know, within a matter of six to eight weeks. And this is not something new. They have, however, changed their mantra quite a bit pretty much since around 2014 to 2016 when we saw a pressure on oil prices. The shale sector in turn came under a lot of pressure from the shareholders, from lenders, to uh, focus on maximizing profits, margins, rather than putting all, you know, all the money, all the profit into growth of production. So that mantra has stayed with the shale sector. So we see oil production in the U.S. continuing to recover. I think this year is touching 13 million barrels per day, which is exceeding the historic high of 2019. But here onwards, it's going to be, I would say, a subdued growth. But more importantly, shale uh, players are not going to respond to high oil prices by quickly ramping up their output. So because that said, it's just the nature of the dynamics of the shale sector has changed as a result of the pressure from their shareholders and lenders. So that's the reason the U.S. is no longer a swing pr- producer, as it were. So OPEC Plus effectively has no counterweight now, which is another reason I say that OPEC Plus is pretty much in probably the best control of markets that one can think of in recent years. So we are now middle of November, tending towards the end, and uh, December is when all the heating bills rise and so on. So Anything from past trends which looks like might influence energy costs going ahead or at least towards the end of the year? Yes. So winter season in the Northern Hemisphere is typically high demand season. You're absolutely right. Heating oil demand goes up in places like uh, Europe and the US. But as OPEC plus meets, we have to keep in mind that whatever they're going to do until December has pretty much already, it's been sealed for 2024. But perhaps more immediately, they're going to look at what should we do in first quarter. Now, as the winter season starts to taper off, the bulk of the first quarter is actually a slow demand season. This is something that Saudi Arabia has pointed out repeatedly. Saudi Arabia, typically the de facto leader of the OPEC plus now, is very, very cautious when it comes to supply in the first quarter. So I think that is probably going to be weighing on their minds as well, that better be cautious restrain Iranian supply a little bit more, err on the side of perhaps cutting more rather than less. I think what OPEC plus would like to see is a continued draining of inventories. They would like to see the forward curve of the crude futures market. You see a contango situation now in Brent and WTI. So basically the front month is trading below the second month. That typically happens when the market is oversupplied. So OPEC plus would want to try and reverse this, maintain a backwardation in the markets. Backwardation typically sees a flow out of inventories rather than oil flowing into inventories. And that is like sort of becomes a virtuous circle in terms of those who want to keep prices high. So all in, I think they are going to be looking to cut at a very minimum, as I said, perhaps at least maintain the existing cuts into the first quarter. Manna, thank you so much for joining me. You're most welcome. Sam Altman returns. Sam Altman will return to lead OpenAI less than five days after he was ejected from the company or by its board and thus playing the lead role in a drama that has had the entire technology world across the world captivated. Altman will come back as CEO and the new board will include Brett Taylor, a former co-CEO of Salesforce, 
And the other directors are Larry Summers, the former US Treasury Secretary and existing member Adam D'Angelo, the co-founder and CEO of Cora Inc. OpenAI, as you know, or in case you didn't know, owns ChatGPT, which is, of course, taking the tech world or rather has taken the tech world by fire. OpenAI is now working to figure out the details, the company said in a post on X, formerly Twitter. The last five days also saw Ortman join Microsoft, OpenAI's largest investor, to lead its AI team. A full-on mutiny by the majority of OpenAI employees threatening to quit the company if Altman was not brought back by the board seemed to have tipped the scales and caused Altman to come back. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella publicly supported Altman throughout this drama, including the part where he seemed to have pulled off a coup by announcing that he was, that is, Sam Altman, joining Microsoft. Now, there would be quite likely some more turbulence in OpenAI given that former Twitch CEO Emmett Shear, who stepped in as interim CEO of OpenAI, will now step aside, though he reacted to the news and said that he was deeply pleased by the return of Sam Altman. All of this, of course, does nothing to address some of the key questions and challenges surrounding artificial intelligence and the near lawlessness with which this technology, including generative AI, is being applied to cause harm or mischief. Think deep fakes in video and audio to start with. There is, of course, good coming out of AI as well and has been for some time, but the current phase is a trying one for technologists and policymakers around the world alike. Binance CEO is also in. Chang Peng Zhao, the CEO of Binance, a crypto exchange, has pleaded guilty to criminal charges for anti-money laundering and US sanctions violations, including allowing transactions with Hamas, a terrorist group, and other terrorist groups under a sweeping deal with the Justice Department in the United States, which is now designed to keep the biggest crypto exchange operating, reported Bloomberg. Now, Sam Bankman-Fried may have been the best-known name in crypto, but rival Zhao, worth about $100 billion at his peak in early 2022, which is just last year, was the wealthiest and most powerful. Binance, the company, has pleaded guilty to criminal charges and will pay about $4 billion in penalties. And Zhao, of course, has stepped down as CEO and will pay a $50 million fine, said Bloomberg. Sam Bankman is, of course, in jail already. It is amazing that two key players in a space which few understand yes, I'm one of them, are facing charges of fraud and will both likely spend quality time behind bars. It's more amazing that this is the sector that's been putting pressure via venture-funded startups on India's banking and regulatory system to give them more legitimacy. While regulators can sometimes be lax or fail to see around the corner when it comes to technological change, thankfully this is one area both the Ministry of Finance and the Reserve Bank of India have held their ground. On just one simple assumption as I see it, how can we legitimize something we can't see or has no underlying asset. Healthcare is a big violator of advertising standards. An Advertising Standards Council of India half-yearly report has said that healthcare has emerged as the most violative sector constituting 21% of all ads processed by them. The surge is attributed to a high volume of medicine and drug advertisements on digital platforms which in itself represented some 80% of all violative advertisements. ASCII said that it had observed a significant increase in ads directly relating to or violating the Drugs and Magic Remedies Act of 1954, leading to the issuance of intimations to advertisers advising either withdrawal or a modification of the advertisement. ASCII also referred 565 advertisements to the Ministry of Ayush, or Alternative Medicine, that's my term, in just six months, compared to about 464 ads referred in the entire last financial year. Healthcare was followed by classical education and personal care at 18% each. The fact that health and education constitute such a high number in terms of misrepresentation is very worrying. Remember that these are areas where consumers are likely or rather most likely to be gullible as well. Indian illegals in the United States There are about 725,000 Indian illegal immigrants in the United States, the third largest population of unauthorized immigrants after Mexico and El Salvador, according to a new Pew Research Center estimate. The number is obviously quite surprising, or maybe not, since there have been increasing reports of Indians joining immigrants from South America, trying to cross America's southern borders through extreme hardship and pain. As of 2021, America's 10.5 million unauthorized immigrants represented about 3% of the total population, but 22% of the foreign-born population, Pew Research said. On that note, have a great day ahead and see you tomorrow.
This was the core report with me, Govind Raj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you, including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening.